Hi, I'm Heather Rice. I was, I'm Barbara's oldest daughter, Bob's stepdaughter. I met Bob when I was 10 years old. He was a truck driver and an alcoholic. Bob told me for years how worthless and no good I was, and he stole my innocence. And I still struggle with my self-worth to this day. Three weeks before September 15th, September 5th, 1985, when he murdered my mother, I told my mom he had been crawling in my bed and violating me. And how was I to know at 15 years old that my life, those words would change forever. We left that night and Bob was angry. He was very angry. He began showing up at her work and yelling and cursing and telling her to come back. September 4th, 1985 was Bob's birthday. He showed up that night where we were living and he demanded her wedding rings. He threw her up against a wall. And my mom asked him, Robert, what do I need to do? Get a restraining order against you? He turned to her and he said, what I'm gonna do to you tomorrow, 10 restraining orders cannot keep me from doing. As he walked down the stairs, he turned to me and he said, kiss her goodbye tonight. This is your fault. And remember, if you'd been nicer, I'd let her live another day. If I hadn't told, she wouldn't have left. And I've carried that with me for nearly 38 years. The morning of September 5th, 1985, my mom went to the police station asking for help. They didn't. She arrived at work at 6.45 a.m. And he, she asked her boss to please not let Bob in. He said he would, but he had to go to the store. Meanwhile, 15 minutes away, Bob was at a pawn shop at 9.55 waiting for it to open. And at 10.40, a trade purchase agreement was drawn up showing where Bob traded her wedding rings for a gun, a 357 Magnum, and a box of hollow point bullets. At 11 a.m., Bob walked into my mom's work and he asked her calmly one last time, Barbie, are you coming home? She said no. He took a gun from his pocket and he shot her and killed her three, shot her three times and killing her. And just like that, her life was over. My sisters and I lost our mother, our, her parents lost their daughter, but the world lost Barbie. He sat and drank beer and waited for the police. My child had been lost, destroyed with abuse and shame, and I harbored hate and anger for every broken, violated piece of my childhood. Nightmares continued on and off for years, and I lived in my own internal hell. But most of all, I blame myself, because all these years later, that one moment still haunts me. What if I hadn't told her? What if I had just taken the abuse? Would she still be alive? I hated him. But that hate... And that anger consumed me and he rented space in my life. Today, I am a survivor. He took my mom's life, but he did not take mine. I choose to break the cycle of abuse and I choose forgiveness. I assure you this has not been easy and I do not condone what Bob did. I loved my mother dearly. I cannot change what he did. I cannot bring her back, not just from her children, but her 11 grandchildren, her nine great grandchildren, she never got to meet, know, or build a relationship with. But my mom was a loving and forgiving person. Love should not hurt, and leaving shouldn't cost you your life. So now that you know my story, I respectfully request you grant Robert Maddox a medical furlough. I forgave him long ago, and my life purging all the hate and anger, anger that once held me captive. I choose compassion and mercy something he could not do. Love will always trump hate and evil. So by granting his furlough today, you're setting me free of all the chains that have bound me my entire life. As a child, no one ever gave me a voice. No one heard my cries. No one stopped the abuse or cared to help me. So let this end with my forgiveness in the memory of my mother who paid the ultimate price for me. Let the last word not be his, but mine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Rice, for the courage and the compassion that you've shown here today. It's uh, amazing uh, what you've been through, how you have forgiven him, and spoken to us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is that the Yes. Uh, Mr. Maddox, uh, the panel in considering uh, the crime in your criminal history, uh, uh, we've outlined uh, the record reflects uh, what the crime was, the length of time that you've served in custody, uh, your institutional conduct, uh, and uh, as the medical experts tell us, there is uh, a low risk uh, that you are a danger to yourself or society 
in your current state. Uh, and the medical assessment of your condition is outlined by uh, Ms. Park and the two other doctors there. Uh, it is uh, my, my vote that uh, you be granted a medical treatment furlough to uh, River Oaks or any other facility uh, that uh, the uh, Department of Corrections uh, and the medical team deem uh, appropriate. Uh, and basically because of the facts and, and because of the request of, of not only uh, Ms. Rice, but her sisters who've also written letters, uh, I'm going to suggest and, and make part of my recommendation uh, that if he is ever recovered sufficiently to be returned to prison, he shall be returned to prison to finish his sentence. That's my vote. Mr. Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Rice. As a, yes. as, as a victim advocate on this board, I'm amazed at your compassion. And I understand this is set you free. Thank you so much for your participation. It, it's, I was amazed at your statement. Wow. Mr. Maddox, Mr. Maddox, talking to you. Oh, yes, sir. I'm going to grant conditionally to a medical people furlough in any event that gain your strength and gain the uh, ability to take care of yourself, you will be reincarcerated. And I'm granting based on the request of your stepdaughter for no other reason than the request of Ms. Heather Wright. Mr. Jim. Mr. Maddox, um, my vote is the same for the same reasons, not because of anything you deserve, this was a home crime, but because of the hardship you were placing on the medical staff at the prison and because of the grace extended to you by Ms. Rice. So my vote today is the same. Mr. Uh, Maddox, you have received three votes to grant your medical treatment furlough. Uh, your your uh, medical treatment furlough has been granted to go to an off-site medical facility uh, currently designated as River Oaks or any other facility that the department uh, determines to be more appropriate if River Oaks for some reason is not available. And if recovered sufficiently, you shall be returned to prison to finish your sentence. Good luck to you, sir. Do you understand what happened? Hmm? Do you understand what happened? Well, not really. Okay, it's okay. So your your stepdaughter, she she um, in the next week or so, okay? They granted your parole. All right. But you owe it all to your stepdaughter, who apparently you did fairly bad things to. But you're going to be released. If you get better, you're going to have to come back to jail. Okay? All right. You got right. it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Park. Now, how powerful was that? Now, if that's not a mic drop, we, we already showed this, but it had just 10,000 views. I'm going through some of the some of the hearings that I've done that I think deserve to be seen, and this is one of them. Can you can you even imagine how incredible that was? 
she took back her power right there. And I don't believe, I don't believe that he he's playing. I he's cognitively there. He's playing like he didn't understand. And that's because he's such a little cockroach. He's so in he's such a a disgusting monster. He didn't know what to do. He couldn't believe that she was taking back that power. He he had to just pretend that he didn't know. That's my opinion. You know, even even the, the the medical personnel there, we see her there at all these Angola hearings. She's seen it all. She broke down in tears. Unbelievable. This is so powerful. We'll go over the documents so that you should know he died just three months later. He's out of here. See ya. Good riddance. It, th this could have played out like a movie in so many ways. With, with the survivor getting the last word while he's rotting away in Angola. And she takes back that power and he dies alone on a bed somewhere without a soul to give him comfort. And he's just, and that's how it ends. We'll read through the documents, although she gave really the info that we needed. But we'll just go through it. Shortly before 10 a.m. on September 5th, 1985, Mark arrived to open his place of business to buy, sell, located in Covington, Louisiana. When Mr. arrived, the defendant was outside waiting for the pawn shop to open. After 30 to 40 minutes of bargaining, the defendant traded some power tools, a microwave oven, a phonograph, and some cassettes in exchange for a Ruger 357 Magnum and some ammunition. After filling out the necessary paperwork for the firearm purchase and a bill of sale, the defendant left the pawn shop and drove his pickup truck to his wife's place of employment. When the defendant arrived, his wife Barbara was apparently wrapping the front legs of a horse with bandages. The defendant walked straight to the barn where his wife was working, entered, and shot her three times with a pistol. Several people heard or witnessed the shooting and saw the defendant leaving the barn with a pistol in hand. It's just insane. He goes to the pawn shop, gets the gun. He chooses a 357, and he goes there while she's just, you know. A veterinarian, Dr. Rod Hart, which was standing outside the barn when the shooting occurred, the defendant walked up to him and handed him the pistol, stating, Hey, Doc, I think you better take this. I just killed my wife. Dr. Hartwish placed the pistol inside his truck and turned it over to the police when they arrived. The defendant walked over to his truck and drank several beers before the police arrived and arrested him. The shots fired by the defendant had struck Barbara in the head, torso, and she was pronounced dead at the scene. After his arrest, the defendant made a tape-recorded statement about the shooting. He stated that his wife had left him approximately three weeks earlier and was living with another man. He explained that he shot her after several unsuccessful attempts to persuade her to return home. He stated that he had been drinking a lot of beer and had not slept for three days. Finally, he stated that he really did love his wife and that he wanted to terminate his life. Although the defendant did not testify at the trial, um, did not testify at trial, this tape statement was introduced to evidence exhibit one. I don't even love these cowards. They always say, I wanted to take my life. So then why didn't you take it? Because you're a coward, you're a cockroach. You know, it's also something interesting, just side topic. You hear it, you hear it work both ways. You hear it when they when they take their life, they're called the coward. And when they don't take it, they're called the coward. And I guess both are true. But uh, it is an interesting debate, right? He actually appealed it. They brought in a psychiatrist. Expert testimony by the psychiatrist testified that the defendant was a very emotional. He was a very emotional person. He noted that the defendant had attempted to take his own life by taking over those pills while in jail awaiting trial. Yeah, well, why didn't he when he had the 357 in his hand? He testified that the defendant's history indicated that the defendant loved his wife and he was very depressed when they separated. <laughs> Don't you love these, these medical experts? 
right? He loved he loved his wife so much. That's why he was um, sexually assaulting his daughter, her, her her daughter, right? Doctor Deville also testified that the defendant was had a drinking problem that his depressed state contributed to his alcohol abuse. Doctor Deviller opined that the defendant's emotional stress or his drinking problem could cause him to have less control to act appropriately. To act appropriately, what? <laughs> what an understatement to the situation if he's been drinking. However, Dr. DeVille testified that the defendant knew the difference between right and wrong at the time of the shooting. Well, at least the doctor had some self-respect. The defendant does not deny that he shot and killed his wife, nor does he rely on the defense of intoxication to argue that he lacks specific intent necessary to commit the second degree. Rather, he contends that the, that the expert testimony by the doctor Establish that the act was one of the sudden passion before his blood cold and this man started. No, it's not sudden passion, dude. It's not. Not when you go to the to 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 the pawn shop and trade in items to get the weapon. That's that's not sudden passion. That's intent. That's first degree. It's pertinent to define second. Okay. Um they probably say the same thing. The jurors were aware that they could respond manslaughter. Yeah, well, I'm happy they didn't. Uh, the jurors concluded the second degree. They concluded this was a case of second. How could this be second degree? Come on. You know, juries are are a bit wacky to me. They concluded this was second degree. He literally went there with the intent to buy a gun to go to her. To, that's not second degree. We have clearly reviewed. Jur jurors are weird. I reviewed the record and find that the evidence supported the jury's determination. We convinced that when the evidence is viewed in light of most favorable state, how could even a jury, I get confused by this stuff. Like this is clearly first degree and I get juries sometimes do strange things like they, they almost feel bad. So they take the lesser charge knowing they're going to get away for life, but jurors are not supposed to do that. Anyways. Um, thank you, Richard, for the info. I'm, uh, I'm glad to be able to have re-shown this to you because this is just very special. And with that, I'll let you go. All right, committee up roll call to order of the day is 11.27 a.m. My name is Brennan Kelsey. I'll be your chair along with me is Mr. Alvin Roche and Mr. Per Wise, uh, staff is for seat of the DOC headquarters in Baton Rouge. Our remote location is Concordia Parish. Is there any staff or support in that room at all with you? Yes, sir. Could you please get staff and support? Staff and support, please introduce yourself. <laughs> Officer Karen I. All right, thank you all. All right, ready for our first case. Please introduce yourself, state your name, and DOC number for the record. I'm Christian Wilcox. The DOC number is uh, 763380. All right, Chris, you heard the introductions. We'll have a parole interview. Ask you some questions. You can respond at the end. You can make a statement. We'll take a vote. Do you understand the process? Yes, sir. And we have uh, Miss Dolly. Uh, Bob will be here. She'll be speaking, and we'll have Michaela Wilcox, whose sister, will be speaking at the appropriate time. Christopher Wilcox, DOC number 763380. You are a first class offender for eligibility date 10 22 2021. Not eligible for good time. Full term date 10 23 2025. Six year sentence and indecent behavior with a juvenile. Does that sound correct? Yes, sir. All right, would you answer Ms. Wise's questions? Good morning. Good morning. How you doing? Good, I can be. That's a good answer. How old are you, for the record? 20. And how long you been in jail? Three years. Uh, so you got arrested 10, 26, and 19, and you've been in jail since then? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Okay, good, good. Um, let me read uh, something that was sent in about your case. We asked the law enforcement community to give us their opinion about the current beliefs, and I want you to hear what they said. They opposed because of the 
horrific facts of the case. Uh, they believe that you are a continuing danger to the community, particularly vulnerable children. Considering his young age and the significant length of time over which he committed this crime, I believe he is highly likely to reoffend. Uh, we, we respectfully uh, state that, uh, that anything less than you serve in your entire sentence would, uh, would not be, would, it would de depreciate the heinous nature of your crime and your predator, predatory behavior. We oppose. What do you say to that? I don't really know what to say. No, right? It's hard, isn't it? That's hard. That's in the record. This, that's uh, that was that was sent to me to us. If all law enforcement is opposed to your early release, I just want to state that for the record. Have you admitted uh, to your mother what? You repeat that. Have you admitted to your mother what you did to your sister? But I believe we have talked about that. Oh, yes or no? Yes or no? Uh, yes. You have admitted to your mother that your sister's statements are true and your statements have been false. Oh. Oh, no. No. Yeah. no. I didn't think so. I just wanted, I just asked. I, just, I was curious about that. Have you had the opportunity to take the sex offender treatment program? Which program? Sex offender treatment. They don't have it uh, here. Okay. What programs have you had? Uh, I took a, a, a anger management class. Okay. That's about all I oh, get it at the time. Yes, I understand. I understand. I understand. Um, you said in your statement that uh, that you are bettering yourself. How are you bettering yourself? I've been get, trying to get as many classes as I can. I've been trying to work, but with with the charge that I have, they they won't let me work. So, uh, is there any uh, any books that your family can send you? That might help you. You can ask them to send you some books, and you can, you know, you can, you know, to uh, to better yourself. Just a suggestion. That's all. I I got some books here that I read. Did you finish high school? No, ma'am. I think there's some books to help you prepare for that high set. That's something. Even if they don't offer it, you know, maybe your mother can send you something. You can start working on that. Uh, working on your high set. Yeah, that's that's something 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 that's all I had, Chairman. Thank you for asking my question. All right. Uh, we'll hear from Miss Dolly. Yes, sir. Go ahead, next day. Um, I don't know how to. I'm I'm new at the Zoom thing. Okay, that's okay. Go ahead and make a mistake. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm his mother, and. I don't believe that he's uh, he's only done something one time, um, and they're saying that they don't want him to get out. But we're doing everything we can to support him out here. He'll have counseling. He has a job. He has a place to live, and he has family support. All of us are supporting him getting out. Even his sister, that him and had him and her had this. Issue. She lives in West Texas now. I believe that he'd be doing better out here than in there. He can actually get help. He can actually get his high school diploma and have a job and have a life. He turned, he was 17 when this happened. He's, he's only 20. I just want him to be able to have a life. And I believe that we can help him do that better than him being stuck in there. This has been extremely hard on our family. And I would like for my son to be able to come home. 
please. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we'll hear from uh, Michaela. No, yes. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm his oldest sister out of the three of us. And I've talked to my younger sister and talked to all of the other family members who were involved, whether it been emotionally or, you know, were there whenever everything happened. And we're all on the same page. We all just want him to come home because like, like my mom said, he's been there since he was 17. He didn't finish high school. He didn't, you know, get to get his high school diploma or walk across the stage for graduation. And I, I honestly believe that he shouldn't have to serve all of the extra time whenever the person who made the statement originally took it back and changed their story several times and has even told me personally that she would rather him just get out and get the help that he needs rather than sit in there and be pushed back and around by the system that isn't getting him the help that he needs because he can't get in the classes he needs to be in because of COVID and all the other issues where he's at. And he has right. my full support and everything, so. Okay, thank you so much for your comment. All right, Christopher, would you like to make a statement on your behalf? Uh, me personally, I would, I would love to get out of this, you know, be approved, pro, just so I can, Know, be able to work and get the high set. So I usually feel like I accomplished something. So just wasting my life. Okay. All right. Thank you. I was found prepared to vote, Miss uh, Miss Live. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, and you are a young man, and, uh, and and there will come a day when you can put this behind you. Uh, and, and you, you can't. But today, my vote is to deny because of the lack of the sex offender treatment uh, and the law enforcement opposition. Uh, I, I just suggest that you write a request to get moved to a facility that offers that program. And you do have a full term date of 2025. So that's that. Best wishes to you, sir. Mr. Uh, Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wilcox, you're in a real bad situation. Uh, you can't get programming, but I would be remiss in doing my job if I would reduce you without the necessary programming that you need. You have a moderate risk assessment telling me that you have a moderate chance of reoffending without that program. I'm going to have to deny your request for that. But you have two votes to deny. I'm also going to vote to deny your request for, uh, your request for the same reason. Stated. Three votes to deny today. Your parole has been denied. Good luck to you. This face, that stare, it scares me. There's something, there's something scary about this. And we did this hearing a long time ago when they first started this channel. So I'm going through some of the uploads that we've done and revisiting them. Some of them have updates. Some of them don't, but many of them, I think, deserve many more views than they have. There's no update on this except that he is still locked up. So all he had to do is finish those programs, but it, he hasn't seemed to have done any of them. This was held initially in September of 2022. And at the time of this recording, April 9, 2024, he's still locked up. Um, you know, he's only 22 years old. What's scarier about this situation? Is it um, him being a monster that would do that to his own sister? Or is it his mother and his sister who is completely basically condoning it or in denial? I don't know. But um, to we see this all the time. And it's terrifying. And that's all I can say is, you know, this is, I think, one of the reasons it is so important for the district attorney, the ADA, to show up so that the victim does not need to feel alone. They don't need to feel ostracized. They don't need to feel wrong. They don't need to feel everything that they're going through already and then just pile on by having 
by having, <laughs> can you imagine mother and sister supporting your brother who sexually assaulted you? You can't make this stuff up. You know, there's, there's really just one article that Richard was able to find that took place in 2019. And um, it's this one right here. And uh, he was um, taken in for second degree sexual assault and obstruction of justice. Man. Can't make this stuff up. But probably why we do this. And with that, I'll let you go. And we'll only allow three people to speak. Okay. So uh, whenever they get in, you know, and when we get to that point, I'll ask Mr. I'm sorry who those three people will be. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. All right, good morning, sir. Good morning, ma'am and, and gentlemen. Would you introduce yourself for the record? Tell us your name and your DOC number, please, sir. Daryl Jude Ansardi, DOC number 603838. And is your family there in the room with you? The rep, uh, yes, ma'am. Will you tell me who no, they are? They're, they're, not in the room. Room. they're not in a room, meeting in another room. Tell, tell me their names so I can write them down for the record. It's, my dad is Charles Ansardi. Okay. My daughter is Brielle Landry. What's her first name? Brielle. Brielle. Okay. My son is Landon Ansardi. My son-in-law is Robert Landry. Right. My aunt is Carolyn Mooneyhan. Right. And my uncle is Jerry Mooneyhan. Now, I don't know if you heard me uh, mention to the officer, only three of those people will be allowed to speak on your behalf. Yes, ma'am. Now, who those three will be? Anyone, whatever, whoever wants to speak on my behalf. Of three, you choose. Uh, my dad. Uh, my daughter. And uh, my aunt. Okay, all right. And they'll each have three minutes to say what they need to say. Uh, let me recognize... Um, so at the appropriate time, we'll call them in to speak on your behalf. Yes, ma'am. Uh, let me recognize the folks we have here with us in Baton Rouge today. We have Joanne Savoy, Leslie Jambon, Kat Caitlin Jambon, Alfred Suri, Lelaina Lobbett, and Brittany Carrier. And three of those folks will also speak at the appropriate time. First, I'll read some information into the record. I ask you to verify that information, Mr. Unfardy, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Roche. Uh, your case has been assigned to him. He'll take the lead on the interview. Yes. At the very end, you'll be allowed to make a statement if you like before we go. Okay. Uh, so you are Daryl J. Ansardi, DOC number 603838. You're here today seeking the commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in Terrebonne Parish in October of 2012 uh, for conviction, manslaughter, and obstruction of justice. She received a 25 year sentence. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, good morning, Mr. Ansardi. Good morning, sir. Uh, just sit back, relax, and we're going to have a conversation, okay? Yes, yes sir. I'm very nervous. <laughs> yes. uh, Madam Chairman, fellow board members, we have Dallas G. Ansardi, EOC number 603-838. Mr. Ansari is here uh, this morning seeking a recommendation for a commutation of sentence for two 2012 convictions. The first conviction was for manslaughter 
in the death of his fiance, Gerald Otro. The second conviction was the obstruction of justice for disposing the body along a lonely stretch of highway in Blue Yard, Louisiana, in the first town. The murder was committed in Caribbean Town. After Miss Hansardi dumped Miss Gautreaux's body, he sold the murder weapon to a local pawn shop in an effort to dispose of all the evidence. On March 8, 2011, he was arrested, originally charged with second degree murder and obstruction of justice. On October 2, 2012, some 19 months after his arrest, he pled guilty to the amended charge of manslaughter and the charge of obstruction of justice. He was sentenced the same day to 25 years in a manslaughter case and 25 years for the obstruction conviction. Both sentences were to run concurrently for a total of 25 years. The applicant is currently 64 years old, and he was 52 years of age at the time of the offense. Ms. Ansari had only been incarcerated for 12 years. Ms. Ansari, tell the panel this morning exactly what happened that day in March 2011, when Ms. Scotro Return from attending a monograph race. Oh, yeah, okay. On Saturday afternoon, she left, and I didn't know where she had went. Okay. I tried calling her several times, and no response. She didn't come on. Uh, tell us what happened. Okay. What happened is when she come back, she couldn't drive. And I had two other ladies brought her home. I, I helped her get in the house. She was she was drunk. And I put her on my couch. And I told her, stay there. I went back outside and, and was working on my truck. We in it. When I came in that night, she was sitting there on the couch. She had my gun on a, on a coffee table. She went to get up. And she had the gun in her hand. And when she started to fall, and I went to catch her, and we both fell down, and the gun went off. It was in one version, and that was the version that you gave, but in one version, and I think that time you gave me a statement, you said when you came in, you argued, and she went into the bedroom and got the gun. The other version, the gun was on the coffee table. Which is it? When I, when I just said, when she, she had the gun already. She went to go get, she don't want to get the gun, all right? And that's when I, we, we fell down. She had the gun in her hand and we both fell at the coffee table and the gun yeah. went off. So, so when did you call 911 to see if you could do anything from this court? I didn't, I did not, sir. I did not call 911. I panicked. So tell me exactly what you did after that. And when I panicked, I just put it, like I said, I put a body in the back of the truck and I went up, dropped it off on a lonely road. Like you would dump what, anything else? No, sir. How long before the body was discovered? A couple of days. So why did you sell the gun to a local pawn shop? Sir? Why did you sell the murder weapon to a local pawn shop? I needed some money. I didn't have no cell phone or nothing. I didn't have no money. I, I needed money. That's all. OK, OK. Um, let, let's continue. You have opposition from the legal community in the 32nd JDC. The judge, the DA's office, they have opposition 
from the victim's family. Uh, Mr. Ansari, I see that you've been arrested on two occasions. Tell me what the first arrest was for. I was arrested? Yes, in the year 2000. Oh, 2000. Well, I was at a friend's house and we had an altercation uh, with another friend. And they, they and I, I, I was beaten on the trail. And you were arrested yeah. for what? They say they put me for domestic. According to your police report, aggravated assault, simple battery, disturbing the peace. Oh, that's it, sir. Yeah, I, I, I had named him from I. And put that out of my mind. I didn't even end up remember this anymore. I put that all behind me, sir. And all those charges were dismissed by the DA's office. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, tell me, what have you done about your anger management problem? Because you have an anger problem. And uh, what have you done since you've been incarcerated to uh, do something about that particular problem? I I gave myself to God. I got closer to Him, and uh, He's leading me every day in the in my path of walking with Him and leading me in the right direction to do the right things. And that and that's good. And I, I I appreciate it. But what kind of rehabilitative program have you completed to take care of your anger management problem? Uh, well, I had I was on in a faith based. I had Bible studies. I had a global study. I had I took a semester of college and everything. Okay, great. Now I see you you completed teach one, uh, reach one, teach one, 12 step program. So tell me what other programs have you completed in your 12 years of incarceration? I, I, like I said, I completed one semester of college, and like a, I did the, uh, the Bible studies, and I, I on uh, every Bible study. Oh, that, that's all. I'm going to make it easy on you. I'm going to call up some good time programs. You tell me whether you completed those programs or not. Pick them away. If you completed, pick them away. What kind of program, sir? Pick them away. <laughs> I never had no, any kind of them programs here, sir. And you completed anger management. I never had that here neither, sir. And you completed thinking for a change. No, sir. I didn't. Uh, I didn't have none of that. Have you had any substance abuse treatment other than twelve step program? No, sir. So you really had had any rehabilitative program in twelve years that you've been incarcerated? The reason That's I all. The only good time credit that I see is you completed a English and history correspondence course, and you received 30 days credit for each one of those. You only have 60 days of good time credit on the books. Is that correct? That's correct. But you yeah. haven't any good time program in order to rehabilitate yourself. Is that correct? On the, on these anger management programs and, and thinking for a change in that, sir, they tell me I have too much time to get into them. Okay. Sure. I understand that. I understand that. Thank you. Uh, the transition plan is in Pearl River, Louisiana, or Dave Bent, Louisiana. Is that correct? I'm going in Pearl River, sir. So you're going to Pearl River. Yes, why, will you, why, why will you be working? I'm going to be working at Showman Brothers Tractors. Okay, and it, that's in Pontchartura? No, that's in Belche, sir. Okay, so tell me, the I live in Pearl River, which is almost on the Mississippi line, and then you're going to drive all the way to um, Tangible Hole, early. Jefferson, and you go work in Plaquemine Parish. Yes, sir. 
at the bottom of the hour and a half, two hours drive each way. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you plan to do that every day? Sir? Plan to do a two hour drive to work and a two hour drive from work each and every day? Yes, sir. Tell me what your current uh, work assignment is at Jackson County. I am a trustee right now. I work in the laundry room, washing clothes. I worked uh, others, others uh, worked in the, excuse me, I'm nervous. I worked in the, on a road crew out in the fields. And uh, I worked at the region bank, cleaning offices for the sheriff and that. And, uh, Got I also work in the kitchen, right? And I also work in the kitchen, sir. Okay. And, and, and since we're talking about your work, I'm going to get into the record. We have a letter from the ward at Blackwood Parish Detention Center saying that you are a hard worker and that you get along with the offenders and with the staff. Yes, sir. Uh, Let's talk about your disciplinary writer. How many disciplinary writers have you had in 12 years of incarceration? None. You have not had one disciplinary writer in 12 years of incarceration? None. Right. Uh, and what level trustee are you? They don't grade us by level, sir. We're just a regular trustee. Great. Tell me about any vocational skills that you might have. I I do I can mechanic work. I can do uh, well mechanic work. I, carpentry. I have that. I can cook. Now, what was your occupation at the time of your incarceration? As my occupation is as a trustee right now. That I'm at law. I'm doing laundry. No, this is not. What was your occupation at the time of your incarceration? I was driving a truck, uh, 18 wheeler. So I had a CDL license. Are you a truck driver? Uh, so, yes, sir. In state or out of state? In state. <laughs> uh, is, is Lieutenant Tenzel in the room? No, sir. Uh, is he close by? Yes, sir. Would you come, would you actually come to the room, please? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Jenna Jensen, we have a letter from your warden, uh, but I'd like to know if you would like to add any remarks, comments, or observations about the time Mr. Ansoni has spent at Blackwood Parish. Yes, sir. He has been uh, a mouse um, inmate because he's now, uh, he's been a good trustee. He's been a responsible trustee, and we haven't had any uh, problems or anything with him. So, I mean, he has been doing well as a trustee and he does his job well and he follow all this well. So we have no issue with um, Mr. Ansoy at all. Yes. Mr. Ansoy, at any time during your life of 64 years, have you had any problems with using illegal drugs or abusing alcohol? I, I did alcohol, sir. Yes, sir, I did. Have you ever used any illegal drugs? No drugs. And how often did you drink? I drank every day, sir. Every day? And yes, sir. How, much, how much did you drink? About six beers a day. So you did a six pack a day, every day, seven days a week? Yes, sir. Weekends, probably two or three six packs. One six pack a day. Even on the weekend? Even on the weekend. 
How did you manage driving the truck and drinking that much alcohol each and every day? It didn't affect me, sir. I, I drove every day. I was I, I was a dedicated truck driver for the company that I worked for. They needed me to work Saturday, Sunday, Monday. I, I worked all during the day, all half of the night. I was a dedicated worker, dedicated to my job. Ask questions. On the particular Saturday we're talking about, and you were washing your car, did you break a six pack while washing the car? Yes, sir, I had. So you were sort of intoxicated at the time you um, shot Ms. Scottrum. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Um, I have a, a, a question, Mr. Ansardi. When you um, you were originally charged with second degree murder, yes, ma'am. And you agreed to a plea agreement for the charge to be reduced to manslaughter, yes, ma'am. So based on that plea deal that you made, why are you submitting a, a computation of your sentence, ma'am? Based on the agreement you made for the plea. Why did you submit an application for commutation of your sentence? Why did I submit this clemency? That's what you're trying to say to me. I really don't understand the question. You made a deal with the district attorney and the victim's family to agree to the 25 year sentence for manslaughter rather than the mandatory life sentence for second degree murder. The deal that you made agreeing to 25 years, why are you submitting an application to have that sentence changed? I've changed my life, my changed my life, ma'am. Um, I've bettered myself. I'm a changed person. I'm not like I used to be. Okay. And are you enrolled in any programs now? I know you've moved around a lot during your periods of incarceration, so programs probably weren't. Uh, easily available for you, but you've been at that facility well over a year. What are you enrolled in now? Uh, I did my one semester of college while I was at. at what are you enrolled in now, today? No, ma'am, I'm in nothing. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. I have no other questions. We'd like to hear from your family. So if you could ask the lieutenant to call in your father uh, and your daughter and your aunt. You want all of them in here at one time, ma'am? I don't know. I'm leaving it up to the lieutenant. Okay. Thank y'all very much. Who wants to speak with my daddy, my daughter, and my aunt? Sorry. You want them all at one time? I'm going to tell you that. I'm I have the uh, article that we can review after this. My daddy, Brielle, and but I gotta tell you, he is one of the most unlikable people we have seen. It's like pulling teeth with him. Come on, come on, come on. Sit you over there. Excuse me, Andy. Now we have the father, the sister, the daughter, the daughter, the daughter, the daughter. Okay, thank you, Lieutenant. So, um, folks, I know that there were more of you who came who would like to speak, but we only allow for three. That's why we call the three of you in, because Mr. Ansardi has chosen you all to speak on his behalf. You'll each have three minutes to say whatever you'd like us to know. So uh, could we start with uh, the name, Aunt Carolyn? Go ahead, ma'am. Go ahead. Well, I think he deserves to be get out of here. He was a very good boy. And he don't deserve to be in here. <laughs> All right, ma'am. <clears throat> Go ahead. And he's going to come and live with me. Yeah. So, I don't know what else to say. Okay, that's good. Thank you, ma'am. 
Uh, Brielle, we hear from you. Ma'am, I do think that he deserves a second chance. Um, he does have grandchildren that he has never seen. He's about, actually, he's going to have two <laughs> new grandchildren coming in this upcoming year. And I mean, I think, he, yes, he did do wrong, but I really feel that he has learned his lesson. And I really think that he will do good now. And I'm really hoping that he can get out and be able to be in myself and my brother's lives and his grandchildren and try to just have a normal life now with us. So if you all can find it in your hearts to give him a second chance, we'd really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And Mr. Charles, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, sir. I, I, I know he, I know he did it wrong, but he should, he should be out. I really need him. I'm getting old enough to get out of here. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you all for being here this morning. We appreciate your input. We're going to hear now from the folks who are here with us and who want to speak in opposition. Uh, could we hear from uh, Ms. Savoy? Click on the other side. I have my good for the honor of this school. I think on the board. Pick up a little bit, please. Oh, sorry, you're close to me. My name is Lorraine Salazar. And this is one of the ones that we are. One thing he did to us that we had to deal with, Sherry Lynn was a beautiful, small person. He shot her with a 357 and dumped her in a ditch of water for several days. Pushed the sun and the water wasn't kind to her body. The sun bleached her hair and the water changed the color of her skin. And the, and changed the color of her skin and the water trailed her body. She had beautiful green eyes and that turned white and were bulging out of her hair. Attached to her body were magnets. So when it came time to make funeral arrangements, because of the condition of her body, we couldn't put it in a casket so we could say our last goodbye and kiss her goodbye. And this is the memory we'll have about her for the rest of our lives. Rest in peace, Sherry Lane. We love and miss you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Leslie? We will make this for the same age. We accepted a plea of 25 minutes. We thought that was fair. I think it's standing here today. I think it's a still agree it's fair. We Already gave Daryl a favor. We could have pushed forward with his charge of second degree murder and put him away for life. And so we gave him a break. From our family, he has had a break. I feel what we gave Daryl is hope that one day maybe he could get out. Sure, he's hopeful today. We have no hope ever to get Sherry, no matter what. Daryl has a history of domestic violence. He would like it to sound like this is something that happened that night between him and Sherry. When Sherry died, a girl contacted me because she saw my name in the paper. And he offered condolences and said, you know, this could be my mom because that, there was domestic abuse on that. And she had to get a restraining order to stay away from him, to get him away from her. 
So we also, it's a pattern for him. He also has a problem of alcoholism. The original murder case had to be back up several times because Barry was suffering cirrhosis of the liver from alcoholism. His violence is triggered by alcohol. I think that's a big part. He gets drunk and he killed somebody. I feel that if he's released, combined with alcoholism and his violence, that he could continue or do this to somebody else. We have no choice but to accept our sentence. And that's life what I'm sharing. We thank today that that was our And I'm in the dark. A My request today is very simple. There are any party should not be granted early release. <laughs> I alone when I hate me. I'm not happy. It has been exactly 12 years and 20 days since I learned of my first And I was 23 years old at the time. And I was 23 years old at the time. Okay. I'm not going to say that it was a And she was scared that Daryl was And she finally had enough and tried to leave. It was a uh, no one can have me or I thought can have me open. And he did. This was no accident. And we settled for two and five years. All the times that I wanted to call my mother, I couldn't. For all the times I wanted to visit her, I couldn't. I got married <clears throat> in 2021. And in my mother's place, I had a chair for her with a picture of her. Her there. They go by the story that my family will tell them what a beautiful woman she was. She had such a big heart. And she would give her maybe the shirt off the head. She loved her name and beauty. But it was taken away. It was taken away in a split second for the subject of taxes. Carol was happy. Daryl and Sorry disposed of my mother's body like she was. And I could not say goodbye. I could not keep turning and keep her out there. A proper feeling. And no one was able to see the mother in the final goodbye that she undoubtedly deserved. So please, my family and I should not share today. To keep them working. And now I'm begging you to please. 
Thank you. All right, Mr. Ansardi, is there a statement you would like to make to the board before we vote? You're, you're on mute, we can't hear you. You're still on mute, so. May need to get the lieutenant to help you unmute him. There we go. Okay, sir, go ahead. I thank uh, thank y'all, the board, for giving taking this time out and this opportunity of hope, and 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 the, both of the families for the remarks of what they have against me. I've changed my life, and I gave my life to God, and I, I'm a changed man. And I thank y'all. God bless. All right, thank you, sir. I think the board's prepared to vote. Mr. Roche will be voting first. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Ansari, my decision today is based on your lack of rehabilitative programs, overwhelming express opposition by the victim's family, opposition from the legal community, law enforcement, DA's office, and simply, Mr. Ansari, insufficient time served a murder of an individual in the dumping of our body. My vote is to deny your request. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd like to thank everybody for being here today on both sides. So it's very difficult to come to these hearings and we appreciate uh, your comments today. Uh, Mr. Ansardi, uh, there are a lot of factors that go into us making our decision. The facts of the case, clearly. Uh, I don't know that you were honest with us about what really happened. I don't know that you know. That you might have been drunk at the time uh, and, and can't remember exactly what happened. I don't know. Uh, got an excellent deal with the district attorney's office, and I'm absolutely certain that the victim's family agreed to that sentence. And they expected you to do the full 25 years. Now, that's a fact. That's not controlling, but that's certainly a factor. The other factors that's clear to me from this interview today, as well as reviewing your documentation, is you're an alcoholic and you've got a serious drinking problem and you've got an anger problem. And you haven't really addressed those things yet. You have a good prison record. That's, that's very important. Uh, but you're in a very structured environment. Uh, I think you need more work. I think that uh, you need to, 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 to get a sobriety plan in place. Uh, you need to do some anger management. And I think that you also need to take some courses on victim impact, what your crime and the cover-up did to the family. So my vote today would be likewise. Good luck to you, sir. Mr. Clayton. OK. Um... As Mrs. Marabella said, I also want to thank the family for coming here and participating today. Uh, I personally can't understand what you're going through, but I can tell it's very trying. And uh, the bottom line to me is he's just not serving. The time. So uh, my vote is like my comrades, I vote for them. All right, Ms. Ansardi, and I do concur with my colleagues. My vote today is to also denied for the reasons that have already been stated. So today, sorry, your application for clemency has been denied. Thank you. All right, Lieutenant, thank you for accommodating us today. Uh, that concludes our business at your facility at 910. Uh, could I say something, ma'am? No, we're done, sir. You know, it's interesting. He comes, he came in kind of like that stout look, confident look. He left with his, I guess, tail between his legs. 
Um, the only part that I feel so terrible for is his family. You know, that's the other part. But what he did is uh, he hurts everyone, not just the victim, <laughs> not just the victim's family, of course himself, but he's not likable. There's not that he's just easy, really. He's easy not to like. Um, here it is. He took the plea deal. He took it. This wonderful woman, his fiance, took her life. Let's see if I can zoom in on this. The way that he took the plea deal, it's just, it, it, it's kind of like an epitome of who he is. Um, he took the stand after admitting to killing his girlfriend and asked the woman's family for forgiveness. They didn't think that the, the apology was sincere, which uh, I don't blame him. Where did he say it? It was... He said it. Um, I loved her. She loved me. It was an accident that happened. I have suffered the consequences. Don't hate me. That's what he said. That's what he said. I have to suffer the consequences. Don't hate me. Sorry, sir, but you are very easy to hate. I have to suffer the consequences. He shot her with a 357, made up a story, threw her in the ditch. They found her partially clothed days later. Yeah. So here's the details. Her partially closed body was found in a ditch on Brule Julia Road on March 7, 2011. That day, he confessed to the deputies that he shot her inside of his trailer, then threw her body in a ditch. The trial was scheduled. He was going to take it all the way to trial, but then he took the plea deal, and they sentenced him that day. Now, the couple were fighting, um, so he, this is what he says. He says that she brought out the gun, and then he eventually turned the gun on her. She was drunk at the time, and he was not. That's what he said, of course. Of course, he wasn't, even though, no, yeah, whatever. Um, the, true, the, the shooting was tragic for, well, tragic situation for both families, though the fact that Ansari tried to hide what he had done did not shed good light on him. And Sardi's assertion that the shooting was an accident is garbage, said the cousin who was at the sentencing. Of course it was garbage. It, he has a good line right here. If it was an accident, you'd call 911, not throw her body in a ditch. Family members present the sentence and believed he was also drunk the day. Well, yeah. And that he brought the gun at himself. I agree with that assumption. Um, they had a history of violence. Like they said, if, if you heard before, someone had called the victim and said, I had a restraining order on him. It could have been me. So this person is not. Um, it showed multiple times alleging that he, one had attacked the other. Court documents show that and um, had accused this lady of punching her repeatedly in the face and choking her. He accused her of pepper spraying him and scratching his face with her nails. She was charged with that. Well, yeah, maybe maybe she would pepper spray you because you can't lay off of her. Maybe she would scratch you because you can't stop beating her. He was charged with misdemeanor domestic domestic battery. Both were. She was charged with aggravated battery when she pepper sprayed him. Okay. He's much bigger than her. He had a scratch on his face. We have pictures of her beat up from him. He's six foot. Wow, he's six foot three. His father was towering over him. He's a big father. He was six foot three. Wow. Look at his, um, he 
Yeah, here's his father. So his father must be like six foot six or something. Six foot three, weighed 295 pounds, uh, and she's five foot four and weighed 140. So um, he was sent to jail, given 10,000 bonds. And Nardi was given a summons for giving her two black eyes. In June 2010, after, I mean, this is a horrible abuse. They only lived together for nine months. Deputies found her with a swollen cheek and two black eyes. Wow. He hit her in the face and dragged her out of his trailer before he called the sheriff's office deputy. Uh, sorry, a misdemeanor summons accusing him of domestic battery. How is that only misdemeanor? How is that only a misdemeanor? The two charges of battery several times after that. He was charged with screwing. Okay. Um, there were bruises around her neck, and she allegedly, and she alleged that she had. Um, and she alleged he had told her, I'm going to kill you this time. I didn't last time, but he was not charged. Why wasn't he charged? Deputies advised that she contact the sheriff office six days later, called the deputies complaining that she had not come to get her things. Tuesday sentencing, read a bit statement in court. Violent death wreaked havoc on her family, mentally, emotionally. He cheated Sherry of her final moments in her life and a proper burial. We hope your serving time is tormented. The past year and a half has been for us. May God have mercy in your soul. Daryl, for we do not. Wow, that's powerful. And it's funny, he shows up like, with the cross thinking this is going to be perfect in his mind. He's like, I'm going to show up. I'm going to say I'm a man of God now and, and they're going to let me out. And Mr. O'Shea really just like hit it on the head. He's like, he's like, that's great and all, but tell me, have you taken victims awareness? Have you taken anger management? Have you taken thinking for a change? Have you taken any substance abuse program? So you haven't had any good time programs. Yeah, that that game was not going to go well over them. Courtroom, the only reason his family, that's really what we thought. He's like, hmm, I'm just going to put on the crucifix and I'll say that I um, won with God and they'll let me out. No, sir, that was not the right move. Uh, 25 years, they said um, the only reason their family accepted was that he'd be sentenced to 25 years because they don't think he would live, survive his sentence. But he, they now put him through this with the commutation hearing. Um, in past court proceedings, they had a liver biopsy and he lost 60 pounds in jail. They said he's not going to survive that long anyways. We'll just have to wait um, they'll have their way with him in prison. They'll have their way with him in prison. Well, he's he's surviving, but I'm not sure if he will make it out. His court apology said was more centered around himself and his family. It wasn't a true apology. He showed no remorse. I agree with it. It was the story should take it as a precautionary tale about domestic violence. Those who went to sit should report it. He stole a man, family member from us violently. During Tuesday sentencing, a bit read a statement in the court. Um, violent death wreaked havoc on our family mentally and emotionally. Um, oh, we read that part already. We read all this, right? It's like a repeat. So, yeah.
it really is terrible. If you think about what he did, he 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 shot her. He then said that it was her fault. She took the gun out. It was a mistake. And then he th threw her body in a ditch and then didn't tell anyone until he was finally, they found her body. That's sick stuff. And even today at his parole hearing, he still said the same story. He still said it was a mistake. They were struggling over the gun. And frankly, I don't believe him. But... It's just it's a horrible tragedy. It just it makes me sick. It's it's just terrible. Um, but if there's any saving grace, it's that he's uh, he didn't pull. He didn't. He wasn't able to fool anyone today. With that, I'll let you go. Well, as you can see, I kept my old unpacking there. Parts of me wanted to redo it, but parts of me was feeling a little bit crunched on time. Um, if there are any other, if there are any parole hearings, if you, it would be a big help. If you see that it has a low view count and was uploaded within the past, maybe six months, a year ago, six months to a year plus, um, and it, it, it deserves more views, send me an email with the link and I can, um, I can give an update on it. I can re-upload it. I can provide a new unpacking. Also, I do have a second channel that covers Connecticut parole hearings, and those hearings are just totally wild. There's something in the water there, and more than half of you subscribed to Mandu are not subscribed to that second channel, so please do check it out. There's going to be a link that pops up here, so you can click on it to see one of those hearings if you haven't already. And thank you, Richard, as always. Thank you, beautiful mods. I don't thank you enough. And with that, I'll let you go.